All right, so we are recording. Let me get this up and out of the way. So what we're going to do today, we're going to make a bit of a transition now to kind of putting your toes in the advanced sequence. When you get into the advanced sequence, and by the way, if you're planning on enrolling in the sequence in the fall of this year, you need to, you need to, you need to go in there and fill out that form that I sent because those are the people that are going to be considered, all right? So we can get you scheduled for your for your uh, entrance exam. But when one of the things that you will go through is a course that is called Advanced Cardiac Life Support. Now, there's many different variations of that course out there, but all of them originate out of the American Heart Association. Same people that do your basic life support course, okay? So when you take EMC 104 here, you have that course, you're finished, you're certified to go out and do, do CPR. The same thing happens with this particular course, as well as, again, when you come in the sequence and you move into the spring, you will take a PALS course. Anybody have any idea what that might mean? Good camp. Yep. Pediatric advanced life support. All right. Now there's a couple of other what I call alphabet courses that you'll take that are not sponsored by the American Heart Association, but ACLS and PALS or ACLS and PALS are. And so what I like to do in this particular class is now that we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel for the semester is now begin to kind of transition you into things that you will experience to a much deeper level than what you will will do now okay so this is basically just kind of an introductory class an overview class for you as far as when when we're looking at this Disregard the date up here. I Every year I forget to go back and change, but every five years, American Heart comes out with new guidelines based upon the previous five years worth of data and research. The latest guidelines came out in 2020, okay? And so we'll be due to write for new guidelines that will be published in 2025. But everything that I'm going to talk to you through today and to a larger degree uh, on Wednesday, Tanner, is based off the 2020 guidelines. Now, when we're looking at these things, okay, in order for ACLS to work, the advanced cardiac life support to work, we have to have a good basic life support or BCLS in place. Okay, so we got to have a good, strong foundation of CPR. Okay, anybody have any idea of what city in the United States might have the highest resuscitation rate or what we call return of spontaneous circulation? We shorten it to a mnemonic writing called ROSC, R-O-S-C. Anybody have an idea of where if you're going to have a heart attack and you're going to go into cardiac arrest, this city is the place to have it. Tanner. San Antonio. Close. Close. Not by geography, but they have a really, really high ROS rate as well. Anybody else? Dallas. Where? Dallas, Texas. Dallas is a little bit down lower, okay? Now, you're thinking big cities, and that makes sense. So the place where you're going to have the most chance of surviving a cardiac arrest is actually going to be Seattle, Washington. Why? Because for decades out there, they have had a good, strong emphasis of community CPR. Folks, Ryan, as a paramedic, the drugs that you're going to give, the procedures that you're going to do, the defibrillation that you're going to give on a cardiac monitor will not do anything if our patient is dead by the time you get there. So one of the things that Seattle has done, and literally they've done this for probably about five decades, is that they have promoted bystander CPR 
and they have promoted widespread distribution of AEDs, automated external defibrillators. That's why um, Seattle King County, if you have a cardiac arrest there, you've got about a 57% survival rate. The national average is about 4%. Okay. Now you're thinking one out of two people are still dying out there. True, because sometimes the heart attack is so severe, so massive, that there's really not anything that can be done for them. But again, would you rather live in a place that has 4% survival or 57% survival? We're actually beginning to see this in some of the towns and cities in central Kentucky. For example, Jessamine County. Joe and I were talking about Jessamine County a while ago. They've got about an 11% survival rate. Why? Because they have an aggressive public CPR program that goes on. Georgetown, just up the up I-75 on, on your way to Cincinnati, they have about a 15% survival rate. Again, because they couple aggressive BLS with really high quality ACLS. And so as we're moving through and as time goes by, you're going to see those survival rates going up higher and higher and higher, okay? But the key here, guys, is none of that's going to work if you're not really proficient in CPR. One of the things that we're gonna institute next fall, for those of you that are coming in, you're gonna to have to qualify on two minutes of CPR on a recording mannequin, okay? And it's not one of those things of, Haley, we're gonna give you one shot at it, and if you don't qualify with having a certain amount of depth of compressions and rate of compressions, we kick you out. No, we're not gonna do that at all. We'll practice with you, we'll work with you until you do hit that. So don't panic on that, all right? So we've got ma mannequins now that are really, really good at electronically ma uh, measuring how well you are, Juju, in both your chest compression rate and depth. Here's the thing to remember. Compression, more important than ventilation. One of the things that I saw when I was teaching it out in Kansas, we would take our, our, our students from Garden City, which was just outside of Dodge City. So... When people say, I, you know, need to get the heck out of Dodge, I can say I've done that on a regular basis because I had students over in Dodge City. But they were over in surgery and the anesthesiologist said, how quickly should I intubate this patient? And the student said, well, probably within a 30 seconds or less. And he said, well, watch this. He ventilated the patient, got his O2 sat up to 98 and then stopped. And 98 stayed there for five minutes. So again, this is why our compressions, now I'm not saying ventilation is not important, okay? It is important, but we used to think we gotta get air in much quicker than what we do chest compressions. Now, the other thing about ACLS is that it's broken up into segments, CC. So you will learn about pulseless arrest, for example, Ventricular fibrillation is always going to be pulseless. Understand, VTAC can sometimes tantrum, come with a pulse or come without. If there's no pulse, it's under pulseless arrest. PEA, somebody remind me, what is PEA? Pulseless electrical activity. What's that mean, Tanner? It means that the heart is discharging, but there's nothing coming out of it, the muscles. Perfect. Perfect. Couldn't say it better myself. Yeah, so PEA and or a systole. All those fall under pulseless arrest. Then the other things we look at, is the heart too slow or is it too fast? Right and give me one of the rhythms in which we would almost always see a too slow rhythm. Help him out, Cam. Yeah, I'll be happy to. So give me an example of a rhythm that we've studied. We've studied all the rhythms that we're going to for this class that would almost always be a too slow rhythm. 
Good. Yeah, idioventricular. And remember, idioventricular can come with a pulse or without a pulse. Okay, so idioventricular, typically when you're looking at that, what would you expect the rate to be? Uh, Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So Chase, give me an example of a rhythm that we would expect to be almost always too fast. Not fast, but too fast. SVT. SVT. Okay. And so you'll learn in this in this class. What do we do with idioventricular rhythm? What do we do with like third degree heart block? Third degree of heart block, fast or slow? Slow, okay. How do we speed it up, okay? And the other thing is like Chase said, with SVT and with VTAC with a pulse, how do we slow it down, okay? Because with SVT, it's typically a heart rate of greater than 150. With VTAC with a pulse, we may actually see a heart rate of greater than 200. The body can't tolerate that, okay? It will crash. And so we want to go in there and, and take care of that, okay? Don't worry about this slide right here. We're going to talk about, no, I, actually, I do want you, even though it says 2015. So there are within ACLS what are known as chains of survival, okay? Within this, what it's going to be is the kind of the pathways that you're going to do as far as for patients that are having not only cardiac arrest, but different cardiac emergencies, okay? So here's the thing that we're looking at. Here's your chain of survival for out of hospital or in hospital cardiac arrest and out of hospital cardiac arrest. So the thing that you're going to know, one of, one of the things that ACLS does is that it's the same course that's taught to us as paramedics, but it's also taught to nurses and physicians. So we're all getting the same information. So they have to learn about out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. We have to learn about in-hospital cardiac arrest. So very quickly, with the in-hospital cardiac arrest, You've got to now identify them, okay? You've got to very quickly identify that your patient is moving into a cardiac arrest so that we can mitigate it, we can stop it, and we call for help, okay? Within hospitals, again, Cam, they will have specialized response teams that, especially with the large hospitals, that these are the kinds of things that that's all that they do. That's the only thing that they do, okay? And so a page is sent out. It's either overhead or it could be through a pager. And now we've got to start with CPR. Again, when, what part of, the, of, of CPR did I say was the most important? Compression. Burn that into the front of your brain, okay? I can guarantee you will see questions on your next exam that have to deal with that particular part. Then we've got to defibrillate. Here's the thing to understand about patients who are in ventricular fibrillation or VTAC without a pulse. So again, with VFib, the heart is just kind of quivering, Cam. It's not moving. There's no organized electricity. There's no blood that's being ejected. And your patient, for all means and purposes, is dead. Okay? So, Joe, if we don't do something about that, our patient, <coughs> excuse me, will literally die. The process, CC, that we see here is that for every minute that goes by that we don't do CPR on a patient with VFib or uh, pulseless VTAC, is their chances of survival drop by 10%. Okay, now that's critical, especially when we're talking about out of hospital cardiac arrest. Let's think about this now, okay? Let's say that we heard a commotion right out there outside our door and we went out to look and we saw someone lying on the floor. They kind of look the color or the blue color or the dark color of your jacket and they don't look like they're breathing. What's the first thing that you're going to do? Say it again. 
So we're going to try to check a pulse. So we're going to do an assessment on our patient. Now, legitimately, let's say that I'm not here. Okay, so y'all are in charge now. How long do you think it's going to take you to adequately do an assessment on that patient that's on the floor? We're going to tally some things up here. Okay, so 10 seconds, Tanner? I would say for a full assessment, about 30 to 35. Okay, so let's come up here and let's split it and we'll say a half minute, all right? Now, what are you going to do next? Okay, but now that's going to be done in your assessment. Okay, okay? I would start administering care the best we can. If we have an extra person, we can tell them to call somebody. Ah, so how long do you think you will be on the phone with 911? A minute. Legitimately, you'll probably be on the phone for two minutes. Okay, so now we're up to 2.5. How long do you think that it will take for an ambulance, even from the ambulance if it's there, if they're not already out on a call, Chase, how long do you think it will take for them to be dispatched and actually be rolling out? Take three minutes. Good. Okay. So now we're at 5.5. Ambulance gets out front. How long do you think it'll take them to get back here to where you're at? About a minute and a half. I'll, I'll go with that. Well, wait a minute. Let me back up. How long do you think it would take them, let's just say there's no traffic whatsoever, to drive from the station over by the football stadium to here? Anybody else? The station right over there, uh -huh. like right across the street from the football stadium. Uh -huh. Yeah, I can speed that in a minute. Okay, we'll go with a minute. Okay. All right, so we're at six and a half minutes, and I think somebody said, "What was it?" You Chase and said a minute and a half for them to park, get their equipment, and find the patient. Okay. So we're at one point five minutes, which comes up to eight minutes. Now, that's in a perfect world. If that patient falls and no one does anything, okay, you guys are not going to be that way. But if that patient falls and no one does anything, that patient only has a 20% chance of survival. Why? Because their brain is dead. We learned in here that when the blood stops going to the brain, the brain itself begins to die off, okay? That's why... As EMS providers, you've got to promote bystander CPR. Chest only, compression only CPR is perfect. Okay. The other thing you got to do is you got to promote early use of an AED. Now, what rhythms do we use an AED on? Come on, I want my class back. Y'all are dead. <laughs> VFIP. What else? Say it again. Is VTAC if they don't have a pulse? So it's pulseless VTAC and it's VFib. Okay. Now here's the thing to remember: if you use an AED on this patient, this patient may get ROSC, ROSC, return of spontaneous circulation, before the ambulance ever arrives. If that patient is perfusing, they got a great chance of survival. Okay. And so that's the thing you got to remember. Let me ask you a question real quick. Where's the nearest AED to this room? Where's your A? Yeah, it's over here by the wall. We've got AEDs on every floor, okay? And most floors have two or more AEDs on them. And so as far as when we're looking at this, this is the key that we've got to do. So as you can see in here, We've got to get defibrillation, and this is the end hospital, and then definitive care, basically, which would be the cath lab and ICU. Now, what is it for you guys? Okay. Again, early recognition, early notification of 911. One of the nice things about cardiac care today is a person, Lucas, may not even know how to do chest only compression, but a dispatcher can talk them through it. 
You don't have to have a person who is now going to be hesitant about doing mouth to mouth on a person that they don't know. I would be hesitant to do that. Wouldn't have a problem if it's a family or maybe a really good friend. But now, if they just do chest compressions, now we can increase that. All right. Early defibrillation. One of the nice things, I fly a lot, especially during the summer. And, and several years ago, Atlanta Hartsfield um, Airport installed, and they basically just covered that airport with AEDs. You can stand at one AED, look to your left and see the next one, look to your right and see the next one. The key is people have to know how to use them. And they're really, really simple, okay? You can't mess them up and you can't deliver a shock when the patient doesn't need a shock, okay? And so that's the thing that you want to kind of remember as far as when you're, when you're doing that. And then what we've got to do here is we've got to get ALS on the scene as quickly as we can. Get that started as soon as we possibly can. And then again, transported to definitive care. Emergency department, then into the cath lab, and then on into ICU. So this is going to be the thing that's going to be the most important chain that you're ever going to see. And this is kind of a slide that indicates more of what that is actually entailing. Now, let me stop here just a minute because you think, well, that was kind of a nice graphic, but does it really apply to me? Yes, it does. Let me see. Are there any questions? Guys must have had a bad, bad weekend. Y'all are dead. I want my other class back. All right, we'll move on. All right. So again, adult basic life support, all right? Now, basically what we're doing is uh, basic life support is care that can be delivered literally by anyone. You don't have to have an EMT card. You don't have to have a paramedic card. You don't have to have anything. You just have to have the knowledge. Now, here's the thing to remember. If you are taking care of a person and you are not on duty, You can still be sued by someone, but the judge will look at it and say, hmm, Bella was here. She did everything right. She was not on duty. She was acting as a good Samaritan. And he will toss that lawsuit out. Understand, we live in America. People like Tanner over here has served in the military honorably for hundreds of years to give us our God-given right to sue for any stupid reason, okay? So yeah, you can still be sued. You can still be have to go through the stress of going into court, but you can't not, and simply because you're sued does not mean you've done something wrong, right? It does not mean that in any way, shape, or form. Many times, it's a person looking for a quick book. Other times, sometimes people mess up. Okay, and so the thing you got to remember is don't be hesitant to provide care for those around you, primarily because you may be their only hope for survival. Now, basic cardiac life support does not involve you giving any drugs or using anything like starting IVs. Now, understand this because you guys are going to become paramedics. And you're going to be tempted. I will tell you, every paramedic is when they're brand new. Oh, I got my own drug back. Quick way to lose your license. Quick way to lose your license, okay? Because if you go and you do all of that stuff and you're not working for an EMS agency, you can literally lose your license, okay, for a number of reasons that you should have or you will learn about an EMC 300. But again, this is basic life support. And remember, on our slide up here, we have to start out with the basics in order for the advance to work, okay? All right, so it's a little past 1035. I'm going to stop there.